Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Mark Judson uh, uh, at Albany Medical College. And uh, I was asked to talk about quality of life and sarcoidosis. And I was also asked to talk about tools to maximize life and minimize stress in sarcoidosis. Those easy topics should take me three or four minutes, <laughs> and, and we'll be out of here. OK. So uh, I am involved with some of the pharmaceutical industry, so I put that up there. Um, I was going to talk quite a bit. Uh, how many people uh, have been Al Tierstein's patients? Raise your hand. You know, I, I was going to say a lot of things, and then I realized, what, I mean, I don't need any, to say anything here at Mount Sinai. I mean, this was a man who did so much for sarcoidosis, did so much for the patients, uh, and did so much for the field of sarcoidosis. It was a privilege to know him. He helped my career tremendously. And uh, I used to be in South Carolina where I had a very large sarcoidosis clinic for 18 years. I saw many patients from New York who were his patients. And that was all I needed to know because uh, I, could, I spoke to them about Dr. Tierstein and that told me all I needed to know about Dr. Tierstein and how much his patients meant to him and how much curing this disease meant to him. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about uh, quality of life. And this may be... Uh, uh, maybe approached a little too scientifically for, uh, for today, but uh, basically uh, this is a, an aspect of disease, not just sarcoid, that physicians uh, have really not paid much attention to for a long, long time, until about the last five or ten years. And now physicians are paying attention to it. The FDA is paying attention to it in terms of having drugs approved. And the FDA is now usually requiring, as one of the endpoints they look at, that the drug improves quality of life. Um, so uh, that's hard to talk over. But anyway, so quality of life has different aspects or domains, as it's called. There's the physical aspect of quality of life, social, emotional, spiritual. Uh, and they have to be looked at in their own dimension. It means individually. You can't look at them at the same time. There are different, little, there are different aspects of quality of life. And the problem is that physicians, in general, don't pay attention to quality of life. They pay attention to objective tests because that's what they're comfortable with. If someone has lung sarcoid, they pay attention to the x-ray, how it's changing, to the breathing test, how that they're changing, because those are objective things they can measure. But the patient really doesn't care if their FEV1, which is a breathing measurement, is improved. They care if they can breathe better. And that doesn't necessarily relate to the x-ray change. It doesn't necessarily relate to the breathing test change. Uh, same with the skin. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, the doctor cares if the skin lesion is getting smaller, if they have a sarcoid skin lesion, if it gets smaller. But if the skin lesion is reduced in size by a half, from maybe five centimeters to two and a half centimeters, and the patient still is embarrassed to go out in public or has to comb their hair over their forehead because they don't want to show the skin lesion or has to wear long sleeve shirts because they don't want people to see their skin lesions, then even though the lesion has shrunk in half, to the patient, doesn't matter very much. Again, this is a, sh a shift that doctors and researchers are, are, are undergoing to pay attention to, does the treatment affect how the patient feels? Just because the breathing test is better doesn't mean the patient's breathing better. Just because the skin lesion is smaller doesn't mean that has a quality of life impact to the patient. So um, I kind of answer this. Why is quality of life, health related quality of life is HRQL, health, that's quality of life basically. Um, it's important because objective tests like breathing tests don't necessarily correlate with quality of life, how the patient feels. And physicians rely on objective tests, so they may be off base. They're looking again at the objective test, but not how it affects the patient's life. But patients care most about quality of life, not the objective tests. And physicians are poor judges of quality of life. Okay, I will admit that. Uh, so this is the situation. You know, the doctor's saying, your tests are better, exclamation point. And the patient says, but I'm still not breathing well. Or the doctor says, your, your breathing tests are better, but I don't like being on prednisone. All your tests are great, but I don't feel good. So I want to show this. And this lady gave me permission to show these slides. This is a lady with skin sarcoidosis. I don't know if you see it really clearly. It's, it's, some of it's right up here. 
She's got a little more. She's got skin sarcoidosis. She was on prednisone. She had bad effects of prednisone. I tried her on two or three other drugs. And uh, so anyway, I, I blew it up a little bit. Now you can maybe see a little more. She's got some skin sarcoidosis here. Now, you know, my opinion here is I don't want to muck around with this lady and give her a lot of drugs because a lot of drugs have side effects and I'm worried about the side effects. But this lady was incapacitated by these skin lesions. And I tried to tell her, I said, listen, I said, you're, you're an attractive woman. You don't, this, she really couldn't function because of these skin lesions. So what I did, because I'm kind of a, you know, a research type of guy, I got a, I got a piece of paper, and I, or I, I got a computer these days. I typed up a little thing. It took me 45 seconds. I threw it across the table to her, and I said, I want you to fill this out right now. Today, my skin lesions, I want you to put an X if on the left side, if they don't bother you at all, and on the right side, if it's your skin lesions are as severe as you could possibly imagine. This is where she marked it. So I put this lady on infliximab, Remicade, intravenous, expensive medication, and got rid of this. So I think this makes the point is that who am I to judge, as long as I'm with a rational person, you know, their quality of life impact of their disease. We have to incorporate how the patient feels about their disease. So physicians don't like to do this because physicians are scientists by nature and they want to quantify everything. And this quality of life stuff, you know, it's hard to quantify. Although I'm going to show you that you can quantify it. Um, and it's not physiologic or mechanistic. We, doctors like to think in terms of granulomas uh, from white blood cells forming these granulomas. They spew out these chemicals and they do various things to various organs in the body. This quality of life doesn't deal with that, doesn't deal with these sort of scientific principles. And uh, the physician also doesn't feel they can do much about this. You know, I can't do anything about how the patient feels. I can just, you know, get the pulmonary function better. I can't do anything about how the patient feels. So this is kind of gobbledygook, but basically we have quality of life measurements over here. These are different ones. These are, these are actual measurements of quality of life, and these are breathing tests. And basically, uh, these are low numbers. You want numbers closer to one. These numbers are closer to zero. What all this is basically saying is that, as I this is quantifying what I said in words. Quality of life assessment by the patient is not very, does not correlate well with the objective breathing tests your doctor does. That's what this basically says. And this gobbledygook basically says that steroid, that patients don't like steroids. How's that for the doctors finally figuring something out? Uh, that steroids adversely affect quality of life. And see, doctors don't put that often in the equation. Again, to go back to the pulmonary function example, someone has pulmonary sarcoid, uh, lung sarcoid, the breathing tests get better, so the doctor's happy, but the steroid effects may be making the patient worse. So that is often not put into the quality of life assessment. People are just looking at the organ involved and not the effect of the medication like the steroids. So what happens is that the quality of life is improving with the steroids, but the toxicity of the steroids are worsening the quality of life. So that has to be taken into account. And this gobbledygook just basically says that doctors are lousy at assessing quality of life. This is the correlation. Again, 0.99 or one is good and zero is bad. These are three experts and how well their opinion about what the patient's symptoms, how, what impact they had on the patient and what the doctor's assessment of that was. They were all lousy. Uh, I was the best of the three. Uh, but we were all lousy, okay? We get like a D or an F, okay? We're all lousy at this. Um, there are many formal tests. You can actually quantify this. There, are, there actually are ways to do it. You give patients standardized forms that they fill out, and you can actually quantify to a reliable degree, believe it or not, the quality of life of a patient with sarcoidosis. I'm not going to, you know, in interest of time, I'm not going to run through these, but there are uh, I'm going to skip all this, actually. But there basically are a whole bunch of these tests, um, uh, but uh, they can't be used very well uh, in the care of patients because they kind of look at everything. And when I'm treating, for example, lung sarcoid, um, I, I need to look at how it's affecting the breathing and everything. The quality of life, it's hard to assess in this quantitative fashion. But there are some things we can look at, such as shortness of breath. There actually are scales to look at shortness of breath that we can use to try to determine if a patient is less short of breath. Um, and I, you know what, I'm not going to go through them all, but there are ways to quantify this. You have to ask the patient how their breathing is, and they can tell you. And you can follow this over time. 
and this is somewhat reliable. There are different ways to do this. Again, I, I think with this audience, I'm not going to go into the details. It's suffice to say there are ways that you actually can quantify uh, someone's shortness of breath to see if they're breathing better. Um, and um, some of this actually is important because um, uh, what happens is these, some of these methods are actually more reliable than just asking the patient, are you breathing better? Because sometimes the patient doesn't, uh, it's just thinking about their one moment in time and can't compare it to previous times. And there are ways with these scales to actually take that into account. Um, fatigue is something that is underappreciated uh, by physicians. And I'm not trying to rag on physicians because I think there are a lot of good doctors, especially all the ones in this room. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, you're, you're just, to, just to, again, go off sidetrack, I'm rambling, but, um, you know, Dr. Tierstein, was, as was mentioned by Dr. Miller, uh, actually is one of a long line of uh, very prominent and important uh, sarcoidosis doctors, from Dr. Silspach to Dr. Tierstein uh, to Dr. Iannuzzi, who was here for a while, to Dr. Padilla. I, I call this the uh, New York Yankees of sarcoid. I mean, you have all the world experts in sarcoid here, so you're privileged to be uh, taken care of by these fine doctors here. But uh, a, a lot of, uh, this is underappreciated that fatigue is very important in sarcoidosis. It's been estimated that about 80% of patients have fatigue, and actually it can be measured. Um, there are scales to measure fatigue, and uh, one of them is this uh, fatigue assessment um, uh, uh, scale, the FAS scale. And I won't bore you with the numbers, but there are ways to quantify how fatigued someone is. This is actually a scale. It's, again, a bunch of questions that you ask the patients, and you can score this. And this has been studied in lots of patients to see what is a, what, what level are you really fatigued and what is a significant difference. You know, if the, if the scale improves two points, does that mean you're really significantly better? Well, there's been, it's, been, it's worked out how many points improvement is a real change in fatigue. And so when I see a patient with fatigue, uh, what I do is I do a, use the uh, uh, fatigue assessment instrument every visit, every patient. And I think Dan Culver does that too, right? Dan, Dr. Culver does that. Uh, and I do this in every patient. So I have like a, you know, I take a blood pressure, I take a oxygen saturation, and I take a FAS. I have a fatigue scale every visit. So I can follow that. And if, I th and if that s score is significant, uh, what I try to do is do a social evaluation. I had a patient a few months ago who was very fatigued, and she ran the dry, clean, the dry cleaning service, a uh, huge dry cleaning service, and she had three daughters. She was taking a ballet, soccer, and something else, and she was up 19 hours. Well, you know, why was she fatigued? Okay? <laughs> so, you know, so you don't, but that's important because you don't want to just come in with drugs. You don't want to start drugs if there's a, a behavioral modification you can do to treat fatigue. So that's the first thing you do, is see if there is something like that. And then if there isn't, they don't need to see a psychiatrist, but they should get a psych see a psychologist and undergo a psychological evaluation, because sometimes depression, which is common in sarcoidosis, can mask as fatigue. Or another psychological problem can mask as fatigue, and you don't want to treat fatigue with drugs when depression needs to be treated. And then if you go through that, then you can uh, do a medical evaluation because sleep apnea, and a lot of patients on steroids are overweight and have sleep apnea, and that is the cause of fatigue. But once you go through all that, there actually are drugs that can be given for fatigue. We don't give them lightly because they have side effects, but there are medications that have been studied. Uh, we studied this uh, uh, several years ago, and then uh, actually a more formal study done at the University of Cincinnati. There are drugs available for fatigue. But again, I, I think you have to go through that process of evaluation before giving a patient one of these drugs. Uh, pain is uh, an important thing in sarcoidosis and uh, needs, is underappreciated, needs to be evaluated. And of course, we look for non-sarcoid causes, but, uh, and there often are non-sarcoid causes of the pain. But uh, if you've excluded those, then we have to think of sarcoidosis, which can uh, cause arthritis. I've lost my point. Oh, there it is. It can cause myopathy is a muscle problem, or it can cause, as Dr. Padilla, uh, Padilla mentioned, a small fiber neuropathy. Uh, uh, the, the, a certain type of neuropathy in sarcoid, which can cause a lot of pain. And uh, even depression and fatigue in sarcoid has been associated with pain. So this is the kind of workup that I do for pain in the patients. So that's about quality of life. Now I'm, I was asked to talk about maximize stress and uh, I mean, maximize life, minimize stress. Now let me just say something as a disclaimer. You definitely picked the wrong person to do this topic. There's no question. <laughs> Okay, but no, you picked the wrong person. You know, ask my wife. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
you know, I have, I have, uh, I've had a lot of stress in my life, um, and uh, I did for a little while. Uh, I uh, get involved in some uh, meditation uh, at the uh, Charleston uh, Tibetan Society when I was in Charleston. And uh, I think I learned a lot from that, which is that most human problems, although not health problems per se, but a lot of human problems are not tangible. I mean, if you think about what upsets us, a lot of it is a relationship with someone or a relative or a, a boss or something. A lot of it is just how we feel. There's nothing tangible. And the idea of meditation is to basically focus, and by focusing, often you can obliterate these non-tangible problems or get them under control. And so I am a big believer in, in meditation and focusing and getting your mind off a lot of problems that we create just in our own mind, which I think is very important. Easier said than done. Actually, to do this is somewhat difficult. Um, uh, and another issue which I am still working on because I used to be very poor at this. I'm still, I've gone from an F to maybe a D. Still poor is frustration. And most of our frustration is related to unrealistic uh, expectation. That's what I've concluded. And, um, you know, the exact, the green here is unrealistic expectation. Like my secretary should be perfect. If I have that as my expectation, then if my secretary makes one mistake on a, on a one out of 10 dictations, you know, I'm going to blow through the roof. But maybe I should ratchet down my expectations. I've got a great secretary. She does a great job. But, you know, she's human, and she's going to make mistakes, and that's part of why she's human and why I'm human. I used to, when I lived in Charleston, go over this bridge. And this was the only way to get from the, the, the community I lived in into downtown Charleston, where MUSC, where my hospital was. And about once a month, there would be a, uh, an accident on that bridge, and you were just stuck. And I used to you know, bang the, the steering wheel. And you know, again, now I've realized, you know, I live in a great place on the other side of that bridge. I have a great life on the other side of that bridge. You know, one of the things, I can't expect the bridge to be smooth every day. One of the things I have to put up with for living in such a great place is that about one time a month, this is going to happen. Again, nothing's happened to that bridge traffic. There's still accidents, but it's my level of expectation that I've ratcheted down, so now I can deal with the, with the frustration. Or my son should get straight A's. Well, he doesn't get straight A's, and uh, i got to cut him some slack, you know? I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a kid like you have kids. So the idea is, you know, to lower your expectation. The result is the same, but if you lower your expectation, you can deal with a lot of life frustration. And, um, and uh, the problem is physical ailments are more difficult, really often can't be handled by meditation. Uh, I said most of the problems we have in life are not tangible. They deal with relationships and with feelings. But some of our problems are physical. And those really you can't meditate away. They're, 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 they're re I mean, they're pain, shortness of breath, things like that. And we can't really do that, but the same concepts really apply. And I really don't want to show the next slide because I guess I'm too much of an egomaniac, so I won't show it. But I want to just try to lay it to myself, is that I used to be a very avid runner, and I used to love running, and I used to run every day. And I got an ankle injury about two years ago, and it basically, make a long story short, never went away. I went to physical therapy, and I did all sorts of crazy things that never went away. And I can't run anymore. And uh, uh, but what I've done is I've had to readjust. I've had to readjust my life, and I've gotten into biking. So this morning, before I came here, I was on the stationary bike. And uh, I, I, this is when we have illness, sometimes we have to compromise, and it's, we're going to succeed if we can work through it, if we can work around it and still uh, maintain our dignity and maintain our, our, our sense of purpose and self-worth with these real obstructions that we have from our health. And so it, it really involves attitude to a great degree. So um, uh, this is it. So I'm going to go through, through that. So <laughs> anyway, so this was a study that was uh, published last year in the International Sarcoid Journal. Um, and it looked at patients in New Zealand with sarcoid. I won't go into all the details of it. But I think what was interesting is that a lot of the patients were anxious. A lot of them were depressed. Um, but uh, I think. See, this, this is really the key thing that I wanted to get to was that the patients who believed that medication was necessary had less emotional impact and a more stable course and less disease consequences. 
And that is something I think is really important, which is that if you think you've lost your sense of control, that's when I think it's difficult as a patient. When you feel that you're kind of just in a sea floating around and you really have no control of what's going on, that's one of the things why these sessions are really important because the idea is if you understand the disease, sarcoidosis, and you understand why the doctor is giving you these medications, you don't have to understand it in incredible detail, but if you buy in to the idea the doctor is really trying to help you and the doctor is using scientific evidence uh, to give you the therapy that you're getting and you kind of buy in that the doctor and you are working as a team to control or conquer this disease, then that really does help you in dealing with it. And it really does help in dealing with stress and with the emotional impact of the disease. So um, uh, I could go on and on, uh, but I think I'll stop. I want to thank you for letting me come today. and. Uh, uh, I hope that every one of you has uh, better times ahead with your sarcoid. Thank you.